Good afternoon, 12 IB. So, uh, I'd like to do a follow-up revision, and this is going to cover World War II's causes, practices, and effects. So, uh, World War II is really a continuation of the events that took place in World War I. It, it's very much linked. Uh, in fact, it was Ferdinand Falk who said this is, not an ar- this is not a peace, this is an armistice for 20 years when he was talking about the Versailles Treaty. So, a lot of people believe that World War I set in motion a chain of events that would eventually resolve themselves with World War II. And this is the most important way to see it. So the wars are definitely linked. Uh, a lot of the causes have to do with the effects of World War I. So right off the bat, we know that Germany was very, very unhappy with the settlement in the post-Versailles Treaty Europe. Uh, now, here's the thing. It's debated how much Hitler was able to sort of grab the German people and influence them. But there was a very large section of the German population that heavily resented the Versailles Peace. So right off the bat, this is one of the biggest factors. And so this really helped Hitler. Once again, it's important to note Hitler's rise to power wasn't just sort of him stopping by one afternoon and being like, hey guys, Versailles Treaty, it sucked, right? And then everyone was like, let's follow that guy. No, it was much more of a struggle because there were other extremists in Germany. He wasn't the only game in town, obviously. Uh, In fact, many historians debate the extent to which Hitler's ideas were even that novel. Because you have to understand, Hitler was kind of just preaching this right-wing expansionist philosophy. And that existed before Hitler. It wasn't maybe as violent or as aggressive as Hitler's, but it existed. Uh, Historians like A.J.P. Taylor, who I encourage you guys to read if you haven't already, just to sort of have an overview... um, A.J.P. Taylor has a revisionist view of it, and he believes that Hitler was really just sort of pushing Germany in the direction it was already going, as opposed to sort of reversing Germany's direction and saying, all right, let's become expansionist and let's become destructive. Now, we do know that after the Versailles Treaty, Germany was crippled and it entered a sort of period of decline, and this was the period in which the Weimar Republic was in charge. Now, the Weimar Republic did manage eventually to cobble together a sort of semi-functional German state. And by 1929, things were going pretty well for them. So the thing is, a lot of people argue that Hitler had difficulty initially because in the initial period of the 20s, Europe was kind of rebuilding itself. And people were sort of recovering, people were sort of looking forward. But then 1929, as you guys know, the market crash happened. So the market crash really changed the game because the previous governments became unsustainable and a lot of them collapsed. As a result of this, uh, the Weimar government did in fact collapse and before long Hitler was able to sort of talk his way into a position of power which he was then able to leverage into a much greater position. Uh, Obviously, we keep mentioning Hitler as being sort of the head honcho of the Nazi party. It's important to note that it wasn't just him. Uh, Hermann Goering was also an instrumental key member of the party, as was Joseph Goebbels. Lots of different different key figures to talk about here. But in any case, uh, this is obviously a very big cause, which is the resentment after World War I. It's also important to note that the territories that Hitler was taking after World War I were predominantly territories that had been taken from Germany or territories that Germany wasn't allowed to have after World War I. So in many ways, people sort of figured, okay, well, we can intervene and we can cause trouble or we can just acknowledge that he's taking back land that we've already taken from him. Uh, So the important thing to understand, by the way, about the, the appeasement process as it's known is there are different ways of looking at it. You, you got people that figured appeasement was uh, weakness, capitulation. It was them sort of bowing and telling Hitler, all right, do what you need to do. And there are people that see appeasement as being pragmatism, you know, practical, real thinking and saying, listen, Hitler's taking the Sudetenland. That's not good, but obviously it's not our problem. And do we want to make it our problem? No, we don't. So the obvious counter argument is that in being weak like this, the Allied powers obviously showed Hitler that they weren't going to intervene. And this was really the thing that gave him more courage and sort of gave him the, uh, the impetus to sort of keep expanding outwards.
so this is obviously one of the big debates. Was appeasement the cause of World War II? Would it have been a shorter and easier war to deal with if they had taken Hitler down in 36, 37, and 38 before he had fully rearmed? Another counter-argument, of course, is that the Allied powers themselves needed to rearm. In fact, uh, England kicked its rearmament into position in 1938. Uh, the Soviet Union wasn't even armed when the war broke out. They actually kind of rearmed during the war, and that's why by 41, 42, they had kind of reached the peak of their rearmament, and that coincided with the decline of Nazi armament. So in any case, another obvious cause was the League of Nations' inability to deal with expansionist regimes. So you didn't just have Nazi Germany, you also had Mussolini's Italy, and you had Imperial Japan. And all of these were right-wing, aggressive states. And all of these were states that were trying to carve a greater role for themselves out uh, in World War II, uh, in, sorry, in Europe, and they were trying to get a bigger piece of the pie. So the League of Nations did famously try to deal with Japan and Italy in respectively the Manchuria and Abyssinia crises. And this sort of shows us that the League of Nations just wasn't prepared to deal with crises on this magnitude because they just really weren't able to confront a lot of these nations. And more importantly, they didn't really have a lot of support. You have to understand that the League of Nations was predominantly made up of nations that weren't that strong. You had the U.S. that was missing. You had the USSR. It was missing a lot of really key players. And the U.S., after World War I, had established itself as a much more important part of European politics. And now it wasn't really part of the League of Nations at all. So on top of that, you have ideology. This is very important to acknowledge. So on the one hand, you had Hitler's fascist expansionist ideology. On the other, you had communism. So the thing about communism, and you guys might recall this from the Spanish Civil War, was that the Europeans in the West were more nervous about communism. They saw communism as the kind of thing that could one day become their problem. Ironically, they saw German expansionism as not really concerning them. And honestly, there might have been a world where it didn't concern them as much. In fact, Hitler was reportedly surprised when the Allies declared war on him because he didn't really see how their interests were being violated. He wasn't going after their territory. He wasn't going after their land. In any case, uh, what happened essentially was that there wasn't as much cooperation between the Allied powers as there should have been because there was always this suspicion as a result of the fact that the communists were perceived as a bigger threat than the fascists. And so, yeah, there was this notion that, well, Hitler, you know, he seems kind of aggressive, but he does serve as a buffer between us and the communists. And this was considered a pretty big deal. So ideology, appeasement, failure of the League of Nations to maintain peace and collective security, and of course, Germany's expansionism. In terms of causes, World War, World War II is pretty basic. It's pretty straightforward. Once again, the main debates are about appeasement, whether or not it was a good strategy, and the League of Nations and what role it played. But the really clear-cut uh, understanding is that, yeah, it was, it was Germany expanding and becoming aggressive and militaristic and declaring war, essentially, on these other countries with its actions. Um, Past that, we have the practices. So World War I can sort of be divided broadly into phases if you talk about the European theater. You've got the initial push, the Blitzkrieg, between 39 and 41, roughly. This was a period of unmitigated success for the Nazis. They just kept going and going, and there was very little stopping them. Uh, then past that, in 41, you have their first setbacks, which are the North African campaign and the Russian campaign, our Operation Barbarossa, as it was later known. Well, it was known at the time. And this is sort of where the Germans kind of started declining. So the main problems with the German military machine was that they spread themselves too thin. And by 41 and 42, they were facing declines in raw material, and the Allies, the British and the Russians, they were actually booming industrially. They were kicking into full gear, and they were throwing every resource they had into it. And this really enabled them to sort of step their production up as Nazi production was going down. So the Soviets, for example, were able to really push tank production to overdrive by 42, and this meant that they had way more tanks, and this is a big deal because the T-34 tank, as you guys may know, was essential in pushing back the Nazi offensive and finally taking the city of Berlin. 
After that, of course, you have the D-Day offenses, which involved America. Uh, a lot of really key World War II battles were based around sort of split-second decisions, uh, really, really good timing. This is really how it worked. A lot of, there was, for example, the miracle at Dunkirk, as it was called, when they evacuated their troops off the coast of Belgium and they got back to England. This was quick thinking. This is what it was. Kind of the decision to sort of uh, pick up a lot of industrial centers and dismantle them and move them in Russia. Uh, this was also a good decision that happened way too late, but happened nonetheless. So you had a lot of this sort of strategy and quick thinking, and this was really the thing that defined World War II's best moments. People sort of deciding, okay, well, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it now. Uh, obviously, huge reliance on air, air, aerial warfare. Uh, besides that, World War II was a very different war in that most of the battles didn't involve soldiers fighting against other soldiers. A lot of it was bombing of civilian areas, a lot of it was attacking civilian centers from both sides. There wasn't really any kind of restriction whereby one side thought, oh, we're not going to attack civilians. No, uh, the German uh, cities of Dresden and Jena were bombed heavily in the war, almost beyond recognition. And the Americans were remarkably aggressive with the Japanese. Now, this is also one of the things that you can kind of debate because the Japanese themselves were very aggressive. So some people could argue, listen, if they didn't, then Japan never would have backed down. They had to make it so that Japan wasn't going to stop, but was going to stop, sorry, because it had to. And this really is the impetus for the, uh, the firebombing of Tokyo and Kyoto and other major cities and the eventual dropping of the atom bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, past that, World War II really becomes defined a lot by uh, faster warfare. It's a misconception that it was fully mechanized. The technology just wasn't there yet for cars and tanks to be the default modes of transportation. A lot of soldiers still traveled on horse. A lot of soldiers still traveled on foot. But it was a faster war. It was more based on aerial warfare. It was more based on tank warfare than previous wars before. Uh, so in terms of effects, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the U.S. and Russia come out on top as the superpowers. Despite the fact that Russia came out on top in the sense that it finally defeated the Nazis, it had been devastated. And this kind of sets the tone for the Cold War, which is Russia, which was already a nation with a really weak and stagnant economy, was now uh, completely in debt because it had lost millions during the war. But still, it had more influence. And the superpower race began. And this sort of pushes us into the Cold War. So then America pushes out the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine to try and prevent communism from spreading into Western Europe. And Stalin, in turn, pushes his reforms to try and take control of Eastern Europe. Germany, of course, was divided into the four quarters, and Berlin itself would later be divided into four quarters, and this would be solidified after, literally, through the Berlin Wall. Uh, in terms of other effects, really just uh, an understanding that global cooperation was much more necessary. And this is really the thing that pushed the United Nations forward a lot more, the understanding that we do have to work together no matter what. And this is why the League of Nations uh, was a bigger failure. There was this sort of understanding that we could try to do collective security if we were missing someone. No, in the United Nations, you're, you never stop being a member. It's remarkable. But if even if you're responsible for massacres or whatever, you're still on board because the understanding is that it's an actual global community effort. Uh, for better or worse, at the very least, that's kind of the effect of it. Uh, socially, it pushed people's sort of rights even further, obviously. Women's rights went even further as well because they played a major role in it. Uh, civil rights really went forward. People started pushing for more democratic and open governments. And besides that, obviously, World War II uh, really created a death, if you will, of fascism. Fascism never really came back. In Europe afterwards, there was sort of a period where there were little movements that kind of thought, hey, maybe fascism will come back. Maybe this is just a setback. They were mistaken. Fascism didn't really recover from it. It died as a movement. In any case, uh, that covers a lot of the key points for World War II. Obviously, if you guys want to check out Rudbeck IB, they have some really great resources, and they can give you a more thorough revision if that's what you're interested in. In any case, thank you.